groups. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. Our guests uh, today are John Carlos, uh, the Olympic medalist, 1968, famous around the world, perhaps the most famous symbol that has ever come out of the Olympics, the Black Power salute on the Olympic medal stand, uh, together with Tommy Smith. Uh, Dave Zirin with us as well, well-known sports writer. Um, they together have written this book, The John Carlos Story. So, you're on the Olympic stand, you have your hands up in the black power salute, your heads are bowed, you're wearing a black shirt, you are there without your shoes on, you've got the beads on to remember lynching, and you've got a shoe on the stand yes. that you've put. We took the Puma shoe out there, and we wanted the world to know that the Puma Shoe Company has supported black athletes throughout the, uh, at least my tenure in track and field, you know, all the way from my high school days. Uh, they weren't concerned about whether he was a superstar in order to receive a period of their product. Uh, they realized very early that in order for their product to sell, the individuals that's trying to come into the sport, break into the sport, needed shoes to wear. They had no reservation about giving the shoes. I, I guess they gave me of dollars of product away to these individuals to wear. I, they gave me a job when I lost my, my, my job going to Trinidad the first time because Pan Am went on a strike and I couldn't come home. And when I didn't have a job, my wife was pregnant, first thing I did was go to the, uh, uh, the Connor Corporation. They were distributors for Puma Shoes here in the United States until I lost my job. I need a, I need a job. And I'm New York City champ, won everything, working for them for two years. They didn't even know I was a New York City champ. And then I had to explain to them uh, at that time, if this was my company, you wouldn't have to ask me who won what or who the champ is. If, if I'm dealing in, in, in this particular product in athletics, I'm supposed to know athletics. So uh, I kept that in mind about who the Puma people were, and I felt that they needed to be a part of this history as well. Mm -hmm. The response after you got off the medal stand. Now, you had one glove, pair of gloves, yes. that you divided. So one has, you have a right. black, uh, you have a, the black power salute is one right hand and one left hand. Well, the gloves was Tommy Smith's gloves. Tommy brought the gloves, gloves out because primarily he did not want to shake hands with Avery Brunners. The worry was that Avery Brunners was going to give us our medals. We were. Explain who Avery Brunners is. Well, Avery Brunners at that time was the international Olympic president. Uh, I think Avery Brunners was a very biased and prejudiced individuals. I think, quite frankly, he was a bigot. But he was in charge of the International Olympic Committee. He's the same individual that stripped Jim Thorpe of his uh, glorious days as an Olympian, as, in my estimation, probably the greatest athlete of all time, merely because he played a softball game or baseball game in North Carolina and got $2. He stripped him of all his Olympic awards. Um, he he uh, invited Hitler to host the Olympic Games when Hitler was in his biggest reign. Uh, he took some Jewish individuals off the team, mm -hmm. uh, circumvented that to the United States, uh, tell them we want uh, these Jews uh, removed from the team because we were in Nazi Germany at that particular time. So he wasn't a pleasant guy to be heading up uh, an organiz organization such as the International Olympic Committee. So Tommy did not want to touch the guy's hand, so he bought the gloves. Fortunately, Mr. Brownlee got wind that something was going down and he didn't want to be involved. So I told Tommy to bring the gloves. And then, collectively, in the tunnel, we got together and decided what we were going to do with the gloves. You know, many stories went out. Uh, John Collins left his gloves home. Uh, John Collins left them in the dorm. There was never any gloves for me to leave. I didn't have any gloves. Mr. Smith had the gloves. So this was a spontaneous action uh, to put on these gloves, one right hand, one left hand. Absolutely. I mean, we bought the artifacts. We decided that we would bring these artifacts together after the quarter semi. We determined that this is something that we want to do, and we wanted to know what artifacts we had, and then we started talking about what we had. And after the race, we had all the artifacts together. And then when we was in the tunnel just before we went out, we distributed what we was going to do and how we was going to do. Dave Zayer, can you talk a little bit about the significance of Avery Brundage? Oh, most certainly. I mean, Avery Brundage stands astride the 20th century Olympic movement like a colossus. He was an Olympian himself. Uh, he won silvers. You know who beat him for the golds all those times was Jim Thorpe, <laughs> interestingly, whose medals he later stripped. Exactly. This is who Avery Brundage was. Th there was a very good chance that Hitler was never going to get the Olympics in 1936. There was a rebellion against that happening in the American Amateur Union in this country. Avery Brundage flew to Germany, met with Hitler 
came back and said, you know what, I spoke to Je it wasn't true, he said, I spoke to many Jews in Nazi Germany, and they think Hitler is great. Jews are treated beautifully here. So he sold the idea that Hitler was an appropriate place for the Olympic, Hitler's Germany was an appropriate place. And he's still there in 68, he's still there in 72, he's still there in 76, and that's when he passes away. I mean, it's, it's one of those things, it's like Dick Cheney syndrome, like evil preserves. He didn't oppose the, the Nazi salute. Oh, Brundage. Brundage about them going to Nazi yeah. Germany. Oh no, no, he made that happen. He he actually facilitated the process that gave the prestige of the Olympics to Hitler's Nazi Germany, and, and then he helped. didn't oppose the use of the Nazi salute salute in the Olympics. Oh, not at all, not at all. This is who Avery Brundage was, and it made perfect sense at the time that he would be part of the demands of John Carlos and Tommy Smith, also because he was threatening everybody involved in the Olympic project for human rights in the years leading up to the Olympic Games. Dire, dark warnings about what would happen to them if they dared step out of line. Once they got to Mexico City, so you were threatened, John Carlos. Well, oh, I was threatened before, during, and after. Uh, you know, I think I was threatened the day I was born. But uh, yet and still, you can't stop your life and, and stop trying to make it a better life for all people merely for merely having threats put upon your life. I mean, you know, if you sit back, we go all the way back to Jesus Christ. He was threatened. It didn't hold him up. Uh, and those individuals, they sacrificed them lives over the years. It didn't hold them up as well. They received just as many threats as. Uh, John Carlson, and Tommy Smith, all Peter Norman for that. So matter. Brundage said you were stripped of your medal to news reporters afterwards? Mm -hmm. Well, they came to us and stated to us in the Hotel Diplomatic where all the officials stay, and, and fortunately we were staying there with our wives as well. So we come downstairs in the elevator, and I'm here listening to them on the uh, radio speak a little Spanish. I don't speak Spanish, but my mom does, so I know a little Spanish when I hear it. And they state that they were going to take our Olympic medals and they were going to run us out the country. And when we got down to the lobby, it was like a flood of uh, reporters there and photographers. And they swamped around us where, right away and started pointing questions. Well, we understand that they're going to take your Olympic medals and they're going to run you out of the country. I said, well, let me step up and tell you right now. I said, I don't know about Mr. Smith. I said, but I'll tell you about John Carlos. The medal doesn't really have any significant value to me. I said, but it might mean everything to my kids. I earned this medal. You didn't give me the medal. You didn't knock on my door and say, we're going to put you on the team. You said a standard. I met the standard. I made it to the finals. I won this medal. So if you're coming to get John Collins' medal, bring the militia, because you're going to need it to get this medal. So then they wiped that away. But for 43 years, uh, uh, this Sunday would be 43 years, and they uh, falsified and propagandized the fact that uh, we've taken John Collins and Tommy Smith's wet medals away because they train individuals to follow this carrot, to chase this carrot. This is the ideal of life, to go to the Olympics to chase this carrot. So if you step out of the circle, therefore, we're going to penalize you and we're going to take your medal away. So they held everybody in check with that for many, many years. Do you think that 43 years later now, do you think that the response, at least in the U.S., would be different to a similar gesture? Well, I think a lot of people are a lot more wiser now than they were back in 1968. I don't think as, as many people are uh, as intimidated as they were back then as, as a result of these young individuals that you see down at uh, Wall Street right now. Uh, many young individuals are stating that hey, enough is enough, same as we stated 43 years ago. Speaking of Occupy Wall Street, let's go down there where you were and we were on Monday night. Uh, you addressed the General Assembly. You then held a teach-in at Occupy Wall Street. Street. Um, let's go to a clip. Dave Zirin and John Carlos. Was a revolutionary year. Was a revolutionary year. You had students in France. You had students in France. You had workers in Mexico City. You had workers in Mexico City. You had the Black Panther Party. You had the Black Panther Party. You had women. You had women. You had LGBT people. Fighting for their rights. Fighting for their rights. You also had the assassination. You also had the assassination of Dr. King. Dr. King. And if there was one moment. And if there was one moment. And if there was one moment that symbolized. That symbolized that year. That year was when John Carlos. When John Carlos. Tommy Smith and Tommy Smith raised their fists raised their fists at the 
1968 Olympics. At the 1968 Olympics. My name is John Carlos. Track and field used to be my game. Uh, as you can see, I have on my shirt, I have the United States flag. I have the flag of the Olympic movement. And also I have down here Mexico City. And if you were to look at Mexico City and think about the Olympics and the United States flag, I could not do any more than think about all the young students that lost their lives that had a, a forum such as we have here today for justice and equality for all people. That's John Carlos and Dave Zirin at Occupy Wall Street. If you were wondering, police have barred protesters from using amplified sound at the encampment, so the crowd always uses the human microphone technique, which repeats your remarks in unison. Um, the significance of people's protests today um, with what you were doing then, and going back, how were, was your career affected afterwards? Well, it was pain, you know. I mean, you, you, you have sunshine going into the games. When you make a statement like that, you expect storms to come. Uh, we had many storms come to us. You know, we didn't have employment after that. Uh, any monies that you had in the bank, the money was going out, nothing was coming in. Uh, those individuals that you thought may have been your friends, uh, a lot of them stepped away from you. Uh, it took some time for you to understand and figure out why would they step away. Uh, most of them stepped away for fear of reprisal. Uh, your kids are ridiculed in school once they find out who, who their dad was. Uh, my first wife got so much on her shoulders to the point where she couldn't take it anymore and she took her life. Mm -hmm. uh, it was many uh, hurts that went on, but yet and still, I always said that if it had to happen, it would have to happen a thousand times more. I would lose my life, or my wife would lose her life, or my kids would have to endure, because what we did in Mexico City was necessary and it was right. We're talking to John Carlos, 1968, the Black Power salute, ever famous. Dave Zirin, as you write about this and uh, wrote with John Carlos his story, what you learned? Oh, my God, what didn't I learn in talking to John? I mean, this is the thing about when you, when you investigate a history and you peel back the onion, so to speak, you begin to actually learn something. And like when you peel back an onion, sometimes it gets a little dusty and the tears come, too. And I found out that there was so much that I thought I knew that I didn't know. Like, I started talking with John, thinking, for example, that his medals were taken away, because that was the mythology that I'd been told for all, for all those many years. And so to be able to actually get at the truth of the story is something I'll never forget. But I got to say, like, writing his story also made me very much appreciate shows like Democracy Now! And I'm not just saying that because I'm on the show. I'll say that on other shows, too. And it's because... When John made his statement, the media was so top-down and so narrow that just a couple of opinion makers got to shape national opinion as to about John Carlos and Tommy Smith. They stood for righteous things. They stood for getting apartheid South Africa and Rhodesia disinvited from the games, Muhammad Ali getting his title back, more African-American coaches. But their story wasn't allowed to be told. Instead, they were called by great sports writers, and I put great in quotes, like Brent Musburger. They were called black-skinned stormtroopers. The Los Angeles Times said they engaged in a Nazi-like salute. Think about the irony of that statement, given Avery Brundage and his history. And so you didn't have the, the kind of media outlets that allowed for them to just come on and tell their own story. And that's why it's so critical that we support media that doesn't allow that kind of top-down nonsense. That does it for our show, part two on our website, democracynow.org. Dave Zirin and John Carlos. The book is called The John Carlos Story. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. So, 